Partnerships lead at General Assembly, which means I reach out to incredible brands and speakers, which we're joined with today um, to help me deliver these community events. So if you're new and joining us for the first time and don't know much about who we are and what we do, uh, General Assembly is a tech education company offering high demand skills in tech. And this is through our full-time and part-time courses, our classes and workshops, and then these free events as well, where our mission is to empower those to pursue a career they love and help them with their career transitions into skills such as UX design, data science, and then software engineering. If you want to know any more about General Assembly, feel free to reach out to our incredible frontline team. Let me pop their email in the chat there. So oznz at ga.co, um, and they'll be happy to answer any questions that you've got. If you do have questions during this session, please do direct it to that Q&A box um, and you can submit these questions anonymously as well. Um, and then we'll have our incredible speakers touching upon it if it is 10 to 15 minutes towards the end. So do make that happen. Please do jump in, in that chat, guys. Introduce yourself with your name, location. Don't be scared. We're all friendly here. Um, we are recording this session as well, so we'll be sure to send that out in a follow-out email. And lastly, before we get started, General Assembly Australia would like to acknowledge our, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the first Australian and traditional custodians of the land where we live, learn, and work, paying our respects to elders past, present, and emerging. That's it from me. Thank you so much, Andy. It's all yours. Take it away. Oh, thank you very much, John. How many times have we been called incredible? That's awesome. We should all be feeling good now. Um, so welcome to Asking for a Friend. Um, Asking for a Friend is an initiative that was put together by Never Not Creative and um, Mentally Healthy and has partners like Young Bloods and General Assembly. And we're really thankful for GA helping us out today. Um, Never, uh, asking for a friend exists because we wanted to create a safe place for where you can ask the unaskable. So the questions that you're worried may change the way people treat you at work or affect the opportunities that might be given to you. And that's why we bring together industry leaders and mental health professionals to give you non-judgmental responses in a safe, anonymous environment. Um, before I introduce our guests, a little bit of housekeeping. So as John said, any questions in the question tab on the right, make sure that... Um, you know, if you want them to remain anonymous, you can you select that option. Um, and also any comments, thoughts, anything you want to share, if you've been experienced something similar, um, stick that into the into the chat as well. Everything that we do with Never Not Creative and Mentally Healthy is volunteer run um, and therefore kind of, I guess, essentially unofficial. Uh, we're a bunch of people using community to come together and tackle the challenges that our industry is facing. So with that in mind, remember that also with this being anonymous, we don't have the context for your questions. Uh, everyone's situation is different, but hopefully the advice you get today is something to consider as you kind of either seek help either professionally or casually from others. Um, and if things are getting very serious for you, you should absolutely seek professional help, whether that's financial, legal or mental health related. Um, on the mental health side of things, I will put in a link in the chat now um, where we've collected some helplines uh, and stuff like that on mentallyhealthy.org. So with all of that, I would love to welcome our guests today. So first off, we have Crystal Fong. Uh, Crystal um, has spent years at agencies, including DDB, JWT, Ogilvy, um, and in 2012 founded Apostrophe, Apostrophe.xyz. Do I say that? Or just yeah, that? let's go with that. Okay. Okay. XYZ. XYZ. Melbourne's first copywriting agency, um, currently peppered across four continents, 20 cities. Um, Apostrophe.xyz will soon be known as a world first, a brand agency that doesn't do pictures. She believes a most significant business achievement is developing a model that allows her to leave it in search of worldly exploration and personal growth. Not as much at the moment of the worldly exploration, I think. Um, Crystal believes that real change begins with meaningful communication and enjoys helping others find what's meaningful for them. Thanks for joining us, Crystal. Thanks, Andy. Crystal and I also worked in the same building. We worked this out, didn't we, like 10 years ago? So long, or 10 years so ago. long ago. Yes. Maybe longer. Maybe longer, maybe longer. Um, and we also have Mary Bonich. Mary is a psychologist dedicated to helping people find their way towards a happier, healthier, more fulfilling life. Mary provides counselling for a wide range of mental health concerns, including workplace stress, anxiety, depression, PTSD, anger issues, work-life balance, interpersonal difficulties, relationship breakdowns, and grief. 
Uh, Mary values community and strongly believes in the reinforcement of social support systems to facilitate healthier communities. Thanks for joining us, Mary. Thanks for having me. So this is how today's going to work. Uh, we've had a uh, good five or six questions come in beforehand. Um, and so we, we have prepared a little bit for those. And then we'll spend probably sort of 25 to 30 minutes going through those. Um, and I please like get your uh, questions in early so that we can get to them um, after we get through these ones that have come in beforehand. So please add those questions into the Q&A panel. That would be fantastic. Obviously, that's what you're here for. So we have a long question first, um, and it's going to come to you, Mary, with this first question. So uh, just uh, bear with me as we get through this one. So I work with a manager that takes all the credit for our success. It does not bother to manage me at all. They treat every meeting as social hour. They stay in bed all day when at home, and they don't check emails. When we're in the office, they only open their laptop to keep that team's icon green. On more than one occasion, they've turned up to work and have forgotten their laptop. They've remained at work because the work phone should suffice. Upper management sees this behavior but doesn't comment or even question their ability to do their job. Upper management doesn't know what to do with me either, the only designer in the company. Some days I've too much to do and not enough time to do so, and other days I'm watching YouTube on my phone because no one has anything for me to do. I previously brought up my grievances and I was met with disciplinary action for reasons I'm still not 100% sure. At this point, I'm just taking the paycheck and looking for new work, but I've lost my passion and I'm really worried this is starting to reflect in my delivery at work and even my job applications. Any tips regarding mental health and how to stay sane? So um, I guess firstly, I would say that, I mean, this is a significant issue. It seems like this person is far more passionate um, and committed to the organisation and to the role than um, what their manager might be or even upper management as well. Culture does not sound great um, at all. I think looking for a workplace that, um, you know, looking for another job is a, is, a great, is a great idea because they're more likely to be able to find um, a role or an organisation that's more values aligned, uh, which is really important for us to be able to feel um, like we are contributing um, professionally, but also um, that we uh, are feeling good about going to work every day. Um, some of the really easy things, I think, or some of the sort of initial things is to make sure that we um, start to look at what's within our control um, and shifting the focus away from what's not being done to what we actually can do um, and focusing on things like making sure that we're getting enough sleep, making sure that we're exercising and eating right just to manage the stress that we're experiencing from being in this situation where we feel like we have no control at all. Um, I would also suggest maybe building relationships or focusing on the relationships with staff that you are um, that you do have alignment with um, and maybe focusing more on the positives, um, those, those positive things at work. Um, and I guess it doesn't sound like there's any opportunity to sort of affect any kind of meaningful change with any of the, the management team. And so um, maybe looking at the things or the aspects of your job that are um, that you do actually still find enjoyable um, and maybe trying to sort of look at ways to harness um, those types of opportunities so that you can continue to build your skill base so that when you are looking for a new role, you've got um, some things that you're proud of that you can showcase um, to a different employer. Um, I would probably also suggest maybe getting some therapy if they have an EAP program, um, maybe accessing that. Um, so that you can actually navigate some of this day-to-day -day stuff that might be showing up um, as you're, at, you know, when you're at work. Great. Yeah. Crystal, anything you want to add there? Have you been in this situation? I haven't been in this exact situation. Um, first, I'm really sorry to hear going through that. It sounds like quite a toxic environment. And uh, yeah, I mean, if the culture at the top's not great and it's funneling all the way through, um, time to find a new job, which is great. I would say um, from this, it sounds like you're really clear about what you don't want in the next place. So I'd almost suggest writing a list of all the things you do want so you can be really focused on the type of relationship that you want with your next boss and the type of environment that you want to work in. And if you have the cash, I'd suggest leaving early. <laughs> Yeah, don't let it seems like it's tarnished your passion and you know if you can leave, leave. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's um it's quite an important one as well to remember as you start looking for another job. Like if you are feeling particularly negative and then you're going into interviews and you're kind of carrying that negativity with you, it's not going to help you um, mm -hmm. get, get a job as well. I, I know I remember um, when I was in London, I had, I met a, a recruiter um, at one job and then I met them again for another job and they noticed a difference in me because I wasn't happy when I saw them the second time. And the, they're like, oh, what happened to you? Like the, the first interview, the first time I met you was great. And I think I'd let some of that get into um, how I presented myself the next time. So that's a quite an important thing to remember is, is that you do need to try and find a way to um, stay positive, even if it's, you know, for those conversations with potential employers. Okay, Crystal, coming over to yes. you. I think someone directed this question especially for you, um, but the idea of starting my own business is always something that I have in the back of my mind, but it just seems so overwhelming that I never do anything about it. How do I take the first step? Um, so, yes, it is overwhelming if you think about it a lot. Um, I would say begin... Begin with the end in mind, knowing that the end might be six months away, 12 months away, 18 months away. We've been in business, we'll be 10 next year. Um, and I never expected to have a business for 10 years. Actually, I never expected to have a business at all. But um, I am not great with commitment. So if I thought about 10 years in business, you know, that would have been a little bit scary. So it was six months, 12 months, 18 months. Um, there is one really great exercise. Um, there's a, a great author named Tim Ferriss, uh, double R, double S, and he has a, a TED talk that is about fear setting. So what a lot of people do is they set up these goals and then they never quite reach them. And then the next year might come and they have the goals and they never quite reach them. And so rather than focusing on the goals, Tim Ferriss suggests that you focus on the fear that exists between you and the goals. And I do it every year. I found it to be really helpful in just unpacking some of those things and, and sticking them up on the wall. There's a great formula um, that he can take you through in a PDF and everything. Um, and some of those fears are very well founded. And then some of them, as soon as they go up on the wall and out of your head, you just look and go, it's not really a big issue. Like I can, I can get around that. So um, yeah, I'd suggest chasing Tim. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you, um, do you also need a trigger? Like, is there a, was there a trigger for you that sort of said, you know, I've, I've got to go and start something now? Yeah. I mean, the trigger was just that um, I don't want to can the big agencies because I learned some really great things and you know, like you, Andy, and I worked under some really incredible people and got to work on some great brands. But ultimately, I had ideas of who I wanted to be outside of work. Um, and I look at my bosses from a creative perspective, and I really love who they are. But there weren't many mentors in terms of the rest of their life, a lot of broken relationships, a lot of infidelity, a lot of uh, drug use. Um, and so, yeah, I just decided, okay, I put a lot of time into this. I really enjoy the work. I don't love the brands that I'm working on. There were some ethical kind of preferences there that there wasn't a space to have those conversations, especially back then. Um, and so that was the trigger for me. Like, I want to use my skills. I want to use them in a different way. And I want to work with people and brands that are working towards a future that I want to be part of. Yeah. Right. Mary, is there anything that you have around, um, I guess it's probably not quite procrastination, but, but like the fear of the first step around like how you can get over it? Yeah, I, I would say that um, so often what happens is that when we set goals, we tend to, you know, we, we can set the big goals, um, you know, quite sort of we, we have an idea about what we want to do and we can set these bigger goals. And if those goals often can feel too overwhelming, um, what we need to do is actually break those goals down into smaller goals and then and then start to approach them like one at a time. And if those smaller goals are still too overwhelming or that first goal is too overwhelming to even keep breaking it down further and further so that basically what you're doing, you're not actually in fact, you're not actually making this, this decision to just jump straight into something that's too overwhelming. And instead, what you're doing is you're just chipping away at it slowly and slowly. And so 
you know, when you reflect, you, you'll actually see that you've made significant progress <laughs> towards actually reaching even that first goal or even that first sort of bigger goal um, without actually feeling like you've taken a big step. Um, so I think a lot of planning around, you know, how, how, um, how you could approach even the little things, like even registering um, an ABN essentially is I've, I've started my own business yeah. technically. And so the idea is that, you know, that's, that's a thing that you get to tick off a list and then you can feel good about um, and you're on the journey. And so, um, and I think that can, that can actually be quite helpful in the context of sort of managing things like anxiety and procrastination. Yeah, I have, can I add one other thing in there? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I think also the language, like finding a term that doesn't feel scary. So even after 10 years internally, we still refer to the business as an experiment, mm -hmm. an experiment with high overheads and everything now, but it's still an experiment because for me, it feels playful and um, exciting and allows for movement and, I don't know, that experiment seems way more fun than own a business, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. So, Mary, you just described my evening last <laughs> night. No joke. So it, it's actually quite interesting. I didn't realise this question was about me in a way. But um, I, so Never Not Creative is actually going to become a charity. And this is something I've been thinking about for over a year but um, I met with a, you can get this kind of free cons creative consultant um, person, I don't know, through the government. And I met with someone last week and they sent me an email after our meeting and said, okay, here's what you need to do. And they basically broke it down into steps. And last night I closed a couple of companies that I'd just had like lying around and registered Never Not Creative for the first time, began the registration process. Um, and it's, yeah, you know what it is, it's a, it's something that was felt so big. Oh my God, how am I going to do this? And then someone said, well, let's start here and off we went. So, um, Amazing. that is good advice, isn't it? Congratulations. Yeah. yeah congratulations. Thanks. I would also, I would also just wanted to add, um, I think it's really important that we're clear on what, why we want to do what we want to do, mm -hmm. um, and keep, keep the focus on what our values are and essentially what, you know, it's not so much, um, I guess we stay, we, we tend to focus on how do we differentiate ourselves? How do we, you know, how do we position a brand? How do we do all of these things? And I think sometimes we lose um, the, the we, we lose that focus on why it was that we wanted to go out and do this thing on our own. And I think that's something that really, um, you know, like if we're going to do something and invest all of ourselves into it, it really has to align um, very, a, a lot with, who we are as people or how we see ourselves in the world and, and what it is, what change we want to affect, because um, I think that's really important in terms of staying motivated and um, managing things like procrastination as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, keeping with you, Mary, the next question is, how might you respond to someone who doesn't let you get a word in edgewise, edgewise, edgeways, interrupts or talks over you when you have an open-ended question to ask yeah so this is this can be actually quite difficult and um difficult to answer i think it depends on a lot of contextual factors like you know is this a is this a um is this a friend is this someone that you um you know is there is this is there a power differential in the relationship um or you know is this um uh someone who you have a strong relationship with where you can have more difficult conversations with or is it not um you know i would always say that face to face uh, is probably um the best way to sort of approach difficult conversations so that there's time to stop think and reflect um but also you can gauge body language but i would actually just ask i would actually raise it i would raise this as something that you know um as being something that I'm finding, I'm actually finding this quite difficult. Um, and, you know, and I would also probably initially just say to them, hey, can we just have a chat about our communication? Can we sit down and find a time to have a talk about, um, you know, how communication goes in this relationship? Because, um, you know, it gives them the opportunity to opt in or out, uh, but also prepare for a conversation that they probably may not necessarily want to have, or they might have some questions around that. Um, so that when you do sit down and have a conversation, um, I would talk about my experience. I would say, hey, you know, sometimes when, when we are engaged in communication, I feel like I don't really get the opportunity to have my say. 
Um, and, you know, I think it's really important, you know, for us to be able to have a strong relationship that we're able to both feel really heard and valued in this, you know, in this relationship. And so do you have any thoughts on this? Um, most people are, you know, pretty receptive if we position things quite well and we're not being, um, if we're not being defensive or if we're not being critical, um, most people are actually willing to listen. Um, and, you know, sometimes we don't have the best personal insight um, and, you know, feedback can often be really useful for other people. Have you experienced this, Crystal? I'm assuming you will have done because, you know, we, this is very much often a thing that gets qu quoted in terms of, you know, females working in the workplace and being interrupted and talked over. Yes, That's, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, more than a few times. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'd love, I am so curious to know more about the, like, the setup for this, this conversation. Um, but I'd start by saying potentially give the person the benefit of the doubt first. You know, maybe they grew up in a family where you did need to speak quite loudly to be heard. Maybe they're feeling a bit insecure themselves and it, and it takes away their ability to listen. Um, and then I'd find, I'd find like the Venn diagram, the common ground, you know, so if depending on the relationship, it might be, I care about you, you care about me, I assume you care about me and I want to have a great relationship with you and this is what I'm finding tricky. Um, and, you know, if it's a boss relationship, it might even start with, I'm, I really want to learn a lot from, from you and, um, and to do that, I, I would love to have the space to ask these questions. I don't know if, if you know, but what I've noticed is blah, 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 when we have these conversations. And then ask permission, you know, would it be okay to have these, these conversations in a different way um, with some suggestions? Mm. Uh, and if that, I mean, depending on the relationship, if that, I mean, this can be quite frustrating. So I think there is a point where um, you might, consider whether you want that person in your life if you want to keep you know having those conversations yeah, yeah right. not as kind as you Mary sorry <laughs> <laughs> not as kind as you yeah yeah um yeah <laughs> um I do agree I think permission is uh super important and I also think that um yeah, some people may not actually be receptive and then you may have to make a tough decision, unfortunately. But, yeah. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> okay, Crystal, coming over to, to you. Um, yeah. So this person's applying for a job. So they, they say, feeling conflicted. I've applied for a full-time role in a charity and I'm now through to the second round interview. I've been asked to write a 900 word direct mail letter for a charity appeal and provide a creative concept for a lift to go with it as part of the process. This is work that would take me a day or two and I might charge between a thousand and two thousand dollars for it as a freelancer. I have paid work to do before Monday and a huge weekend of family stuff ahead before the interview first thing on Monday morning when it must be supplied. I really like the team but this feels like a big time investment for free along with preparing for the interview, am I out of touch with what's expected? When I saw the brief, I felt my heart began to race. Mm. Yeah, I mean, again, super curious to ask more questions. It does seem like a pretty big ask for a second round interview, but I imagine it's quite a, a good organization if they, maybe they have quite a few people and so they have the power to, to essentially test out your skills before you start. Um, have work to do before Monday and a huge weekend of family stuff ahead. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. So if it's full-time role in charity, um, I'd just love to ask more questions about this. If this is a, you know, if this is an indication of what's expected moving forward and you've got a charity job and another job, then you know, it might, it might actually be a good time to ask more questions about what's going to be expected from you moving forward. Yeah. It's almost, isn't it? It's almost a little bit like a pitch. Is this kind of free pitching, but for a job? Um, I think, I mean, I know where I sort of sit on that, which is, you know, if you want to do this, then maybe 
why don't you pay for this work? I guess it's the case of if you're going to use this work, then you should pay for it. Um, mm. And if I'm going to do this work and you're actually get looking to use it for an upcoming project, then why don't you pay me as a freelancer? And then you can, you know, you'll get the experience of us working together. Um, and then if you still want to hire me for the full-time job afterwards, then great. But if mm. not, you know, I got paid for doing the work um, mm. is where obviously there is, you know, that's, I've made some assumptions, but um, that's where I end up. Is your, is your uh, understanding of this, Andy, that the full-time role is paid? Yeah, I think so. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, cool. Then I, I'd negotiate some days off, some additional days off. If you get the job. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're looking at a thousand to two thousand, just figure out how many days that would be worth yeah. the wage and see if you can negotiate there. Then I it's can, a really good investment for you if you get the job. I, I can imagine there is a uh, some probably internal conflict here, which is if I don't do it and somebody else does, mm. then I'm not going to get the job. Um, but I think. Ultimately, if you can explain respectfully your situation um, and how you do want to be considered for the role um, and find another way for you to kind of exhibit what it is that they need to see, then that might be a way to, to do it. Um, in an old agency, we got asked to pitch free work for a big project. Um, we said no because we didn't believe in giving work away for free. Three other agencies pitched. Uh, creative work we continued chatting and talking about how we like to work and we got the job um, oh and so sometimes it works out um, <laughs> yeah and you know it really becomes about you because also you don't want to be in the situation where this isn't a you know a beauty contest to get a job mm. um, ultimately they're hiring you not a piece of work that you've done so mm. I mean the other option is you could also ask for an extension if you're really yeah. into it, like let them know, hey, I really want to do this. I want to, I want to share something that's a good reflection of what I can do in the future. I have a family situation at the moment. Yeah. Could I have an extra day? Yeah. Seems like a reasonable request. I actually had someone do that to me this week. I'm hiring for a role in the UK, and they said, hey, I've got a, a really busy week at work and um, a big weekend. Can I get it to you on Tuesday next week? Um, this wasn't a piece of work. It was a, they record a demo of using stream time. But, um, and I said, yeah, of course, life first, right? Life yeah. Second. Yeah. Um, cool. Okay. That was, a, that, was a, that was a good discussion around that one. Uh, and we're about to move to our last um, question that's been sent in beforehand. And then we, I can see there's a few questions coming in into the uh, Q&A, which is great. So keep, keep them coming. Um, Mary, how might you foster a conversation with a long-time friend, I think these in, inverted commas, we were debating how important they are, um, who is avoidant or conflict adverse, e.g. hanging up the conference call during key moments of the call, changing topics when conversations about responsibility comes up. So how, how do we manage um, our friends in that instance? Mm, I guess some. Um... Uh, this is kind of tricky because, um, you know, approaching this person directly might give you more of the same um, in terms of what you've been experiencing mm. in the past. Um, so I guess um, if face to face again, so, you know, that there's no opportunity for the person to sort of hang up or um, just terminate a call. Um, if you do bring it up, but I would, um, again, similarly to what we were saying before about um, setting up the time and maybe mentioning it, that this is something that we really we, I would like to talk about. Um, and, you know, you know, once they've, if, if they've agreed to the conversation to come in and they're, they're able to sort of maybe prepare themselves, I would go softly, I guess, if someone is conflict of avoidant or uh, they're probably quite an anxious person um, and would do, you know, like I guess would do anything that they need to do in order to feel emotionally safe um, in any kind of challenging situations. Um, you know, and I ask them for feedback, like, you know, um, you know, hey, I've noticed this is coming up and it's actually impacting our relationship. You know, have you had any um, situations where you've had to 
had to address some things that were quite difficult and what worked for you in that situation. Is this something that we can start doing in this, in this relationship as well? Um, because it's actually impacting our ability to have um, a friendship. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, just being really supportive. Um, obviously, this friend has um, some stuff going on and um, is probably, um, you know, quite aware that this is what they do, um, a bit maybe not so aware that, that it's actually impacting their relationships in this way. Anything to add, Crystal? Yeah, I think the same thing. I think the use of friend implies that they're probably on the same level. This isn't me. That they're, they're on the same level in terms of um, where they're working. Um, yeah, I would try if the, if the call's too much for this person, try and email. Try and email, share your point of view. Again, try and find that common ground of if they are a friend, I, I care about your job here care about mine I care about the organization that we work for and um, to move this forward here, here's my suggestion and then again ask for permission can we have a conversation about this or, or how would you like to move forward and mm. um, those sorts of things it's good I think that that advice around permission is really good because these things can often lead to quite heated scenarios can't they and so actually just going hey can we find time to put some uh, some space aside for this is a good is really good advice very easy to jump to things in the heat of the moment. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, we're going to move to questions that have started coming in. Um, so, and I'm glad someone asked this, asked this question because I think they asked it last time and we didn't get to it. So, um, can you speak on and share books or podcasts on rewiring the brain away from procrastination, anxiety, and fear of success or failure? Mary, let's start with um, you around that one. Any good resources that you can recommend around that? Mm, so I think just in terms of, I mean, the, the book I love is by Norman Dodge, um, The Brain That Changes Itself. Uh, it's quite an old book, though. I don't really, I'm not up with the technology, so I don't know if any podcasts, maybe share, uh, Crystal can sort of help us help me out here. Um and I guess it's, it's just more about the book actually talks a lot about how we move away from behaviours that, um, that we find actually are quite limiting um, or behaviours that are uh, restricting us from being able to do the things that we want to do in life. Um, and so it may not necessarily be, um, oh, there it is, it may not necessarily be a, um, uh, you know, face, but focus just purely on success and failure um, but really about sort of managing those fears. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat the question again Andy? Yeah yeah. Uh, can you speak on and share books or podcasts on rewiring the brain away from procrastination, anxiety and fear of success or failure? Mm. Yeah I mean uh, all right I'll share a light example and then maybe a heavier one yeah. um, but essentialism by Greg McCowan, McEwen is great um, it's all about um, how many options you have and how they can essentially when you become more um, successful it can lead to failure because you get all of these opportunities and if you say yes the more you end up over here when you actually wanted to be here mm -hmm. and so that's kind of the foundation of the book but it is really helpful in being disciplined about the things that are um, important to you and the things that aren't and then it, it almost takes away some of the the emotional cues from decision making and it, it makes it quite a rational process so I definitely recommend that um, also the Tim Ferriss exercise again um, big fan of Tim um, so yeah the, Is that the name of that exercise yeah it's called fear setting, fear setting. great TED talk and then there's a pdf online yeah oh. um, and if you wanted to go really deep with that um, there is a great book called the body keeps the score versa bandicoat um, and it talks about how stress and anxiety is held in the body. Um, it's a heavy read. <laughs> it's a really heavy read, but it's brilliant. Um, and there's one other thing that pops into my head. Mm, might have to get back to you later on that yeah, one. Yeah, that's all yeah. right. Just stick it in the um, stick it in the chat if you if you remember it. There you so, go. All those books are in there. 
Yeah, I just want to make one little sort of note about the body keep score. If you've had any significant uh, trauma in your past, uh, then um, read that book with caution yeah. um, because it can be quite triggering. Uh, and so if you if you do want to read it, it's a great book. I love it. Uh, and it's actually um, written in a way that actually helps um, sort of join join those pieces, you know, put all those pieces together so that we can work through stuff, but um, also maybe consider doing that and having some other psychological support um, if there has been any significant trauma in the past. Cool. Okay. All right, next question. Um, how do I handle discrimination and not let it get us down and not hold on to that rejection moving forward? Um, so I guess this is someone who's experiencing some type of discrimination at the moment um, that is impacting them. Um, and it's maybe leading to, you know, them not being felt, I guess they're not feeling like they're included. Um, Mary, this does feel like a, a yeah. counseling question yeah. <laughs> how, so if, um, how would you if, respond if it's happening in the workplace and it definitely needs to be um it definitely it's illegal <laughs> definitely needs to be um raised with management if it's management that are being discriminatory then i would talk to hr uh, there needs to be some process within an organization to manage um uh, psychological safety in an organization and um, discrimination is um, something that needs to be dealt with um, uh, seriously. Um, if it's just something that's being experienced day to day, I, I think it's really important for us to have, um, make sure that we have safe people around us and, and make sure that we focus on, on building um, really strong connections with people that um, we're aligned with or people that share our values or people that are actually really supportive and nurturing. I mean, it's unfortunate that it happens. Um, and it's just, you know, hopefully as, as you know, as the world progresses that we're we're actually you know um these these types of things stop it start to change um but i guess um reconnecting with our values reconnecting with what it is that makes us an amazing person and unique and special and having people around us that share um these values is really really important Crystal, anything to, to add? Yeah, um, yes, I, I would say that I've experienced that a, a bit. Sometimes I'm aware of it and sometimes I'm, I'm not. I mean, I think there's probably some racial discrimination. My surname's Fong. Um, and young, a young woman working in um, an industry full of older men. So there's definitely some discrimination there, at least back in the day. Um, I mean... This kind of thing just makes me really mad. Mm. It makes me really angry. Um, and I do my best to get that anger out on a page or like just write some notes or share it, you know, share the conversation with a friend. I have, I mean, again, beginning with the end in mind, if this person or these people don't know what they're doing, there is probably a an opportunity for a conversation rather than acting from anger, which is probably going to just make them quite defensive. I've had conversations with, with older men in the past um, with really like setting up my intention first is to educate and then hopefully, hopefully affect some long-term change. And I've been really surprised with the responses. Sometimes I actually get an apology. Um, I have had people say to me, you know, thank you. No one said this to me before. And now I'm a little bit more aware moving forward. Sometimes they're not always aware of, of what, what they're doing. It's not always intentional. Get the anger out first, though. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. It's um, I actually, on the, so on the Never Not Creative podcast, we had a conversation recently which does touch on this subject. Um, and it was sort of in the, in the realms of our um, platform called Never Not International Women's Day. Um, but it's, uh, it is a good conversation um, and may help this person just kind of hear another perspective as well. So I've just popped that into the, into the chat too. Okay. I feel like this next one may be also kind of coming down as a similar alley. So um, <clears throat> how do you deal when a mean girls scenario is happening at work? 
specifically if it's coming from a couple of senior leaders. I've seen it happen a few times from the same people and the current target seems to be my boss leading the creative team. It seems unreasonable expectations and targets have been set and I'm concerned about my boss's mental health with the constant barrage of criticisms and putting down. This bullying behavior and microaggression has happened to me from one of the aforementioned people and I fought back by calling them out on it. Probably not the best way to have approached it, but they've left me alone. So I guess there's two parts to this. There's almost like the effect of um, how it feels for the person who's sort of um, experiencing it. And then there's the person who's kind of witnessing mm -hmm. it. Um, how do we deal with that scenario happening at work? Do you want to go first, Crystal? Sure, yeah. Um, that sounds like a horrible environment. Mm, it does. Um, um, so I'd, I'd say firstly, your, your boss is probably not feeling great about the situation. So if you can let them know that you're there to support them, that would probably be a good start. And then I don't know if there's a, another <laughs> layer of management beyond the mean girls, but if there is, perhaps you could, you know, have a conversation with them and, and align on the goals. Again, the common ground. I mean, it just seems like high school behavior and it's, um, yeah. Yeah, that would be my suggestion. Yeah. Mary? Yeah, I would probably um, yeah, I agree with, um, with uh, Crystal in terms of approaching your manager and making sure your manager's okay and maybe even um, just letting them know that you've been through something similar uh, and how you approach that situation. And so, and the fact that it's, the fact that it's, um, that they've left you alone um, means that, you know, I, I guess obviously it's worked. It says, I mean, you've written probably not the best way to have approached it, but they've left me alone. So um, you got the outcome that you wanted. Um, I guess the, the scary thing about this is that they'll probably just move on to someone else, even if this situation uh, with your manager has is addressed. Um, so it really kind of, you know, needs to be, Something that's escalated outside of just that team, if possible. I don't. I don't know what the organized how the organization is structured. Mm. Um, yeah, and it just sounds like the culprit. Like if they're seeing it's senior leaders, then the culture is probably not going to be one that's um, conducive to people actually standing up for themselves and, and being able to sort of address stuff like this. Mm. Um, right. The other thing I would do, sorry, just I'm thinking for an org site perspective is I would document, document everything, every situation that happens, every, um, because microaggression is actually really toxic and it can actually strip away at, at your confidence, your self-esteem, whether you're witnessing it or experiencing it, it actually leads to this sort of environment where you're just feeling really psychologically unsafe at work. You never know when they're going to turn on you. You never know when they're going to redirect it in some other way. Mm. Um, and so just having everything documented um, often makes us feel like we've got some control over the situation, but also if anything does happen, if your manager does decide to put in a formal complaint, you've actually got some data there um, and it, it's, it's, it's almost like there's something there to actually help support that person, but also to sort of safeguard yourself as well. That's, yeah, that's really good advice. It's, it does sound like this is a culture you don't want to be in. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's one of those things, isn't it? It's like you could, you know, you could, you could be the person that fights back and helps change things. Um, or you could go, you know what, look, this just isn't right for me. And I think ultimately at the end of the day, if you're in a culture that's not helping you, you need to, to get out. And I think also like if that, if that helps other people make that decision as well, then that's probably a good a good thing because there are plenty of great businesses and cultures out there um, mm -hmm. yeah yeah it, imagine what that could do for you it's almost it's almost like you think in in this case it's not a case of um is the grass greener on the other side i think it probably definitely is yeah <laughs> I also, right. sorry also just wanted to say that um we have to be careful that we're not fighting other people's fights, um, particularly when we don't have the authority or the power to do so, because it can just um, leave us to feeling a little bit more hopeless than, um, than, than before. And it can actually really impact, um, you know, our mental health as well. So we want to be supportive. We want to be, you know, like a resource. We want to be able to sort of help support other people. Um, 
but at the same time we don't want to take we don't want to fight their fights for them yeah yeah great um the theme the theme continues i think so we're just going deeper into this topic now so um this next question is what self-dialogue can we create when facing a hating family member or a sabotager? Why do bullies react like that mean girls question when we confront them and what could we do instead? We are in your office, Mary. This is, <laughs> this is, this is um, Yeah. Self-dialogue can we create when facing a hating member, family member or sabotager? Um, so why do bullies react like that? Um, I'd say because they're insecure, they they kind of need to sort of puff puff their chests and and sort of you know um, I guess you know um, they wouldn't they wouldn't have to do it unless unless there was something that they were trying to sort of conceal or sort of work through. Um, and often when you call out a bully, uh, they initially will attack. And then they then they retreat. Um, and in the workplace, it's really difficult because in a workplace, um, it can be quite uh, difficult to actually confront um, to confront a bully um, because they're likely to escalate. And we have to remain professional; otherwise, it becomes you know we lose we lose any opportunity that we might have to actually get an outcome that we want. Um, and you know then it could be also escalated um, further up the chain as well. Um, and so that, 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 that bit we have to be careful about. So I'm just reading the question. Um, and what self-dialogue can we create when facing a hating family member or a sabotage? Well, I mean, I guess do what well, the first thing you want to do is consider whether or not maintaining that relationship is, um, the going to keep you safe. Um, we need to first and foremost prioritize our own mental health and, if um, if we have like if it's at work, um, then you know some relationships we need to sort of I guess we don't get to choose the people that we work with. Um, I know we don't get to choose our family members either, but we can actually put in a lot of. Um, it's easier to put boundaries in with family than it is with colleagues. Um, so, but I would actually consider actually reinforcing some really strong boundaries there. Um, you know, what keeps us safe? What are the things that we're allowed to talk about? What are the things that we're allowed to engage with? So if it's a work colleague, let's keep it strictly professional. Let's keep it strictly work um, related. And if they if they um, start to sort of cross that boundary, um, then we just keep, we need to consistently reinforce and disengage from communication. I mean, you can do the same with family. They may not like it as much, um, um, but it is possible. There's a really great book, um, Boundaries by Dr. Henry Cloud. Uh, it is written, um, it's, he's, he's from uh, Middle America, so um, there's, it's very American, um, and, um, but it's a great book and he talks, about, um, talks through really great strategies to be able to sort of work through around setting up boundaries with um, people that don't understand boundaries. Oh, there it is in the chat. Anything you want to add, Crystal? Yeah, I mean, again, I'm so curious to ask more questions about this, but um, I mean, the self-dialogue thing, I have been in a situation that sounds similar before. Um, I, I just go inward and become hyper aware of it's really easy to get into to conflict in those sorts of situations, especially if they're family or someone close. So um, I'm always forever working on becoming quite aware of my state because there is a line where I'm at all oh, feeling uncomfortable, feeling uncomfortable, setting a boundary, boundaries being ignored. And then I, I will usually at that point say, I'm going to go for a, a walk. I need to leave this conversation for a little bit. And then, yeah, the same thing. If it's causing so much damage, then consider how much, how much capacity you have for that kind of relationship. Yeah. Cool. Lighter work-related question. <laughs> when is it or when is it not appropriate to ask the potential client for their budget when they ask for a quote? Is that for me? I think so. Yeah, I say I say it's always. Always. Appropriate. Yeah, I say always. Um, even if they don't tell you, I mean, it's the last question we asked, last two, well, actually three. 
What are your timings? Do you have a budget? Do you have a budget? And if so, what is it? Um, and then how are you making this decision? Um, because how, how someone responds to that tells you where you, how important the job is, how serious they are, and then also how much time you should put into it. If you're really busy with a whole bunch of quotes, then someone who knows exactly what they want, when they want it, and how much they want to spend, um, I'm going to put those people first. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the other thing we try and do is um, we do a lot of work in the US. So at the end of the call, I'll say something along the lines of, so we can keep the momentum going. It'd be great to organize a follow-up call. I'll run through the quote with you then. Um, I'll send it through just before and you can be prepared with any questions. Mm -hmm. And if, they're, um, if they don't commit to that, it usually tells me they're not that serious, in which case it helps me shuffle around my, you know, Yep. hierarchy in terms of my list of things to do yeah 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 i, I said, um, always talk about money it's important uh, so i just did an event on this exact topic last week um and i'm going to pop the video into um the chat so um this person can go and check that out but i can tell you that only 19 percent of agencies get a budget from their client before they quote wow Isn't that crazy um yeah. so and the advice on that session was around um, like just giving your client upfront some ranges to gauge their interest. So, you know, oh, well, normally for this type of project, it's sort of 20 to 40 or it's 10 to 20 or whatever it is. Um, and it just really helps to kind of get them to understand early on. Because the worst thing you can do is do a whole bunch of work on a proposal and then find out that they've got, you know, a tenth of what they really need to work with you to do the job. So. Yeah, absolutely. We, we share, um, especially I think look for the language in the first email that comes through. If the first mm. question is about price, you can probably skip a step or make it a more efficient process for yourself by saying, this is our minimum fee. This yep. is the average spend. Let me know if that's in the ballpark and we can organize a chat. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's nothing worse than having a half hour chat and then realizing they don't, they have half of your minimum yeah. fee to spend. And they always have a budget. <laughs> yeah. <They do. laughs> All right. Next question. I've recently left a toxic work environment and really struggling to feel motivated to re enter the industry. Any tips for deciding whether it's the industry I've lost interest in or an outcome of the negative environment? I'll come to you first, Crystal. Yeah. That one's really tough. Were you feeling, struggling to feel motivated to re-enter the industry? I guess uh, they're questioning the industry because of the experience that they had at their last employer. Yeah. I'd probably go back and see if it's a pattern, if this, if this kind of thing existed before mm -hmm. that and before that, and because now you know what you don't want. So then moving towards what you do want um finding you know if you're still in love with the industry potentially then just finding someone who does it a different way i mean it's kind of as in advertising for a while and moved through lots of big agencies and i was kind of questioning the same thing because you know there was some there was kind of some toxic energy in all of those big agencies um and so yeah i started to to look for alternatives it does take a little while to figure out whether it's the industry or yeah, whether it's the industry that you've fallen out of love with or yeah. I just get everything down on the page. Yeah. Yeah. Is this for Mary, uh, uh, some of your advice earlier, I think around like finding out what you want and your values and this kind of thing is that that's probably similar here. Yeah, I think also maybe having a think about what, what it was that you were connected to in the first place mm -hmm. um, and sort of like maybe reconnecting with that. So if you, you know, were you passionate about the industry or were you passionate about the work that you were able to produce and then what value was that providing and how did that, how did that line up with what was meaningful to you or what was important to you? Um, so, I mean, I guess the two will go hand in hand. Um, and is there is there another way for you to be able to do the work that you're that you that you're passionate about doing in a different industry? Because um, our skills are 
transferable and we can do different we can do the same things across different sort of spaces and so maybe even having a think about whether that's an option um you know like unfortunately there are some industries that are notoriously uh you know that have really high expectations um and when we tend to work people um really hard and um, maybe not have great cultures um but there are always um, businesses out there that don't operate in the same way as well. So there's always there, there's always hope. <laughs> yep. But um, I also think that, you know, I guess if we can look for what's meaningful to us outside of the actual industry itself, um, that can be quite helpful too. Yeah. Yeah, even, even getting down on a page, all the things that you did really enjoy about about your job, um, separate from the toxic environment. Um, and that will probably, that'll probably, the things you enjoy, the things you didn't enjoy, and that'll probably tell you whether the, it's time to transfer those skills into something else or whether it's, it's, you know, putting those skills into a nicer environment. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think find some community as well. Like there are, there's lots of people enjoying the industry, enjoying the job, like, you know, and even I expect in some cases for, for some people that environment isn't toxic and like what's toxic to one person is quite different to, to another. So mm -hmm. I reckon it's a little bit of a case as well of like find your tribe um, mm -hmm. and, you know, some places you won't fit in and some places you will because they're right for you and, you know, you all kind of like-minded and have similar purposes and, and goals. Mm -hmm. uh, we're coming to the end. So I do have three left. We'll see whether we can, I don't know whether we'll get to all of them, but let's, uh, let's tackle this one. Uh, Crystal, this one's for you. I'm a freelance designer and have a client who was great at first, but now doesn't respect my time or boundaries. How do I break up with them respectfully when I know they badmouth other contractors undeservedly? Oh, that's a tough one. Oh, that's really tough. Um, yeah, with the time and boundaries, it's really difficult. We, we did have a, a, a real chatter of a client um lovely but yeah real chatter um it would never be a five minute conversation it would be a two hour you know, debrief um and just really extroverted who so needed to kind of talk about everything to then land on a decision and so we switched it to a um a consulting we didn't have that offering but we made that offering for this client um you know i'm happy to have this conversation with you as a consultant and we charged for that um, that time and which she was actually really happy to pay for um, it just it wasn't actually on our menu mm -hmm. at all as an option so uh, we just we created that but yeah breaking up oof I mean I think writing down all the reasons why you might not be a good fit for this client and again finding the common ground like if you're not enjoying the work anymore and you're not enjoying the engagement chances are you're not producing great work for this person either so yeah so this is uh it's not me it's you it's not <laughs> you it's me type conversation <laughs> would, it, would it work in, just in in your industry as well to refer them on to someone who you know actually is a better fit for them as we like we would in in therapy if if we have a client that we're not sort of um uh feeling like we're actually meeting their needs or really, the rapport's not there, we would find someone that we think would be a better fit for them and sort of kind yeah, of... Yeah, um, sorry. Yeah, someone with really, really concrete boundaries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or someone, you know, that um, you're happy to hand this client over to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. Um, all right, I think... I think... Okay, so there's two questions. We're going to pick... Oh, you know what? It is 131, in fact. Um, so what we're going to do is we are going to end it there. Um, and what I'm going to do is I will come back to Crystal and Mary over email and we'll get maybe just a few bullet points, if you both don't mind, to the answer sure. the last two questions. Yep. Uh, yes. Let me make sure I don't lose them. And um, we'll put them up on our Discord. So if you haven't joined our Discord, um, then you can jump in to this link and join there and we'll uh, we'll get that up and we'll also get the recording of this up on uh, nevernotcreative.org as well um so we're going to wrap it up thank you very much um to both of you it's been brilliant we got into some really deep topics there as well um and it was fantastic to kind of have the expertise 
with us. Oh, I've got a, a link, an error link. Oh, yeah, I know why that is. Okay. Um, and so I think, you know, again, it's been another great asking for a friend. Um, I really appreciate the time that you've taken out. Thank you to everyone as well who has, um, put, got, I guess, asked the questions because that's the, the, the key thing. This, this doesn't work unless we've got questions to answers uh, and um, answer. And I think there's been more this session than we've ever had before. So um, that was really good to see. It shows us that we still need to keep doing it. Um, <laughs> So yes, thank you very much. John, I think is probably lurking somewhere um, and will come back and end this for us. And here is the link that I got wrong. I think that's right. Um, thank uh, you for someone telling me it was an error. <laughs> if not, we'll be sure to include it in our follow-up email anyway oh, with the recording. So not to worry. Um, but Andy, I feel like you've done a great job of wrapping it up and I feel like I can't do any better. No, so well, we, we all just want to come around your place, John. I know it's, it's it's rainy outside. It's not great, and you have Sydney's arguably Sydney's best corner of an apartment. <laughs> I can't see the rest of it. But, Come um, over. I think I'll pop we all the kettle on. Right. There. <laughs> Excellent. Done. The kettle's on. Feel free. I'm here. Uh, but no, thank you so much, Andy, for putting this incredible event together. For everyone who's still on, submitting those questions, engaging in the chat. You guys are always awesome. But that's it.